this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and this is episode four of our series called A Passover Backstory. At the end of the last episode, my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss, mentioned the Shabbos Goy when referring to a loophole in the Jewish law. Let's pick up where we left off. Oh my gosh, dinner rolls were gonna be excommunicated. Are Easter Bunny's kosher? Jesus Christ, who forgot the matzah? Wait, a separate checks, please. Quick, someone call the Shabbos Goy. In the synagogue where I grew up, our man was Frank. If Frank wasn't at work on the Sabbath, the place would have shut down. Now, a goy is simply a non-Jew. It's not a derogatory term, unless your Jewish son or daughter begins secretly dating a shiksa or a shegetz, a non-Jewish girl or a non-Jewish boy. In the context of the Shabbos goy, a cooperative non-Jewish person performs important services to assist observant Jews and or one's local shul, the synagogue. In the simplest terms, someone needs to turn on the lights for services or fire up the furnace if the temperature drops. When the furnace or gas stove must be lit, someone must light it. Fires and work are prohibited on the Sabbath. But it is perfectly fine for a non-Jew to perform such perfunctory tasks. Hence, the Shabbos Goy. Without him or her, we might be in the dark, cold and hungry or we'd break the rules ourselves. Now, some might consider this a workaround to avoid breaking the rule. Others see it as a reasonable way to remain technically observant and accept a little help from our gracious neighbors who are not obligated to follow the same Sabbath rules. But how much work is it to flip on a light switch? It's no work at all. Is there really a Sabbath fire lit when the switch is flipped on? Well, that depends on who did the electric wiring or to which rabbi you ask the question. Is it more work to walk miles to temple or to take a leisurely drive? Driving is less work and easier on one's body, but internal combustion engines burn fuel with tiny sparks. No fires of any kind are allowed during Sabbath. The rabbis decided that the work of hiking the temple is less of a violation than traveling by car. Conversely, climbing countless flights of stairs might be another matter. When you visit large hotels in Israel, you'll notice some of the elevators accommodate Sabbath guests in a unique manner. If you are new to the experience, you will quickly learn that if the elevator automatically stops at all 28 floors, all the way up, and then again, all the way down, it means you picked the Sabbath elevator. This is because the rabbis decided it was okay to ride on an electric elevator as long as one did not need to push the little button that selected your floor. Observant Jews are exempted from climbing the stairs on Sabbath if the elevator has the correct program installed to automatically stop at each floor. It makes for a long choppy ride on packed elevators, but it circumvents the problem of using a delightful modern electric convenience on the Sabbath. And it's great that the rabbis have found workarounds to help observant Jews abide by the Sabbath regulations without giving up all the modern conveniences afforded by our high-tech age of electric lights, gas stoves, indoor plumbing, or rolled toilet paper. People want what people want. Creative rabbis find ways to be accommodating. As Blue Greenberg, a Jewish feminist author, said, 
Where there is a rabbinic will, there is a halachic way. And that is a clever way of saying the rabbinic laws are flexible. As the U.S. Supreme Court sometimes interpret the Constitution in ways to fit current viewpoints held by the judges, so the rabbis sometimes craft legal opinions that interpret certain biblical restrictions in ways that make it less demanding for adherence by modern Jews. And it is in that spirit that religious legal experts created an innovative Passover workaround. This is a good one. It's called Mechirat Chametz, the sale of our leaven. So you might wonder at Passover, where's the Chametz? Who are you going to call Chametz Busters? How does a practitioner ensure that no trace of yeast remains in their home? God said, no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. This important Passover prohibition seems clear. No chametz is to remain in your house. But houses are pretty big, and chametz can be pretty small. So how can you be sure you got it all? It rhymes. The rabbis created a fascinating modern interpretation to solve this Passover problem in a most inventive way. The tradition requires a careful cleaning process to be certain that a home is kosher for Passover, Pesedek. Observant Jews attempt to remove every trace of leaven, chametz, from their dwelling. Not even a crumb of leaven is to remain. God wants our homes and our lives to be pure. Do we? The rabbinic tradition has enhanced the procedure. No doubt religious Jews have a desire to please God. Nevertheless, our traditions may inadvertently circumvent his instructions with rabbinic approval. So I have a question. How can a Jew be expected to destroy all his products with leaven if his livelihood was dependent on the items? For example, I mean, it would be an unrealistic hardship to ask a Jewish shopkeeper, a caterer, a baker, to destroy the myriad of leavened products in his or her inventory. Or consider a family on a tight budget. They could be deeply stressed if required to destroy the foods in their pantry or cabinets. Aha, uh -huh. but we have an answer. Mechirat Chametz, a legal fiction, was invented. This creative system allowed us to have our cake mix and eat it too after Pesach. It was decided by the rabbis that Jews could temporarily sell their comets to non-Jews. In this manner, it was not required to destroy everything ritually impure. Neither was it necessary to really remove it from their homes, according to the rabbis' imaginative interpretation. In modern times, a local rabbi was enabled to represent all the Jews of his congregation to symbolically sell their chametz to a cooperative non-Jew for a symbolic fee. The Jewish congregant would then simply tie a ribbon around their cupboard doors to make the leaven products theoretically inaccessible. The deal was made, money changed hands, the leaven remained exactly where it would be found after Passover, and everybody wins. But is it really legal or truly righteous? Now, the ceremonial aspect of children watching and helping their parents clean the chametz from their homes had great spiritual value. The intricate preparations of a family culminating in a Passover gathering was both meaningful and remarkable. Even some secularized Jews reconnect to their roots at Passover as they prepare for the ceremony. And I appreciate the lovely traditions that surround our festival. But I wonder what some youngsters think when they see a cute ribbon tying the handles shut on the frosted flakes or snack cabinet. Do they instinctively think, oh, I don't know, something's not quite genuine? As a teenager, I noticed these things and found them to feel disingenuous. And now, in a time when teens and young adults seek authenticity of faith 
what do such religious contrivances communicate? Are they curious if the leaven is really supposed to be removed? Do some wonder if leaven is really forbidden or is it simply hidden? Like so many other forbidden acts in life, which might be creatively covered up. Now, my parents were completely forthright people, so I never doubted their motives. Yet, if we're honest observers, some traditional practices do raise questions. I mean, here's one. Who likes Passover food? Really? That one question has just never been answered to my satisfaction. Why do we pretend to enjoy such bland foods? Even the internet understands. That is, that's why sites promising and promoting nine Passover desserts that don't suck are popular. The obvious is true. Most truly kosher Passover foods sound better than they taste. We didn't always use one of my dad's sagatas. Growing up, we would actually have Passover with my larger extended family. And there is a joke that I'm often reminded of when, uh, when I was younger, they often will have some of the younger kids and you know, the children would participate in the Haggadah during the service, you know, in the, in the Seder, so that you know, we as kids would learn the teachings and principles and the story of the Passover. That's part of the concept, you know, from generation to generation, the door of a door. Well, I remember one thing that I'm reminded of often and that's when I misread the words on the page. I was reading uh, one of the passages about God revealing himself. Only me as a eight or nine year old, I misread and I said God relieved himself and everybody pretty much lost their composure. <laughs> I'm reminded about it often. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the program. We've got a lot more to come, so stick around. We'll be back in a moment. Did you know that leprosy still exists? That's why a few years ago, we worked with World Missionary Evangelism to create a leper clinic here in India where we provide the medicines and food and the gospel on a daily basis. One thing we found was that the children of leper patients were contracting the disease as well because they get the disease through regular daily contact over long periods of time. So we worked with WME to create a children's home where the children of these leper patients could live nearby their family, but give them a hope and a future free of the disease. Would you consider sponsoring one of these children? Would you consider helping to give them a hope and a future? For just $25 a month, you can give that hope. You can provide that future. Less than a dollar a day. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. I hope you haven't forgot everything you learned before the break. We're going to jump right back in and there's a lot more to go. So I'm going to throw this back to my dad. Look, anyone who has ended a fast after the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, or in any extended time of prayer and fasting, you recognize the joy of finally eating whatever foods have been eliminated from one's diet. For those who enjoy eight days of breadless and I would say arguably tasteless Passover foods a run to the donut shop or burger joint after Passover can be much more pleasing than remembered before the fast. My Jewish mother of blessed memory was a fantastic Jewish cook. My sister might be an even greater wizard in the kitchen. If you tasted her Purim pastries, you'd consider conversion. Still, I could never understate the culinary crisis created by the Passover dietary restrictions. I'm sorry, but a cute story explains my sentiment about unleavened Passover foods. True story. So a rabbi sat down next to a blind man on a bench in the park during Passover. Don't believe everything I say. The rabbi was munching on some matzah. He could see that his neighbor looked hungry. So after a short time, he nudged the blind man and he gave him a piece of his lunch matzah. The blind man, took a bite, tapped the rabbi on his shoulder, and politely asked, who wrote this? Like the blind man, I must say, 
I've eaten Passover items that tasted like a comic book, but this regulatory rigging is really sort of comical. Some problematic festival requirements are now being managed in the most ingenious ways. And I will again ask, is that legal too? 21st century Jews can now rid their home of chametz without ever leaving their living room or changing out of their pajamas. Entrepreneurial services enable cooperative goyim. Goyim is the plural of goy, Gentile. To partner with smart Jewish businessmen who have the foresight to solve an annual problem experienced by observant Jews. Literally. Nowadays, you don't even need to call the rabbi to make your deal. You can simply go online to sell your chametz, no muss, no fuss. It's authorized and certified by leading halachic authorities. The rules now provide that online authorizations are acceptable for the purpose of selling chametz. But even the experts recognize that everyone must squint to make this look kosher. Their own online marketing states, quote, the traditional and preferred practice, however, is for the authorization transaction to be done in person with the local rabbi, unquote. I do not know if the preferred practice is better because it avoids cutting out the local rabbi and violating his franchise territory, or if some might worry it fails to pass the smell test. Is this what God had in mind when he instructed Moses? I mean, was he told to pretend to remove the leaven, or was he told to remove the leaven? Is it really okay to retain real possession of that which is forbidden without retaining legal possession? I understand that it's enough to satisfy the rabbinic regulation. I mean, it says so plainly on their internet website. Though it seems like a very strange theological stretch. This proposition is not from the wacko fringe of the Jewish faith. It was declared by one of the most respected and admired ultra-Orthodox Jewish organizations in the world. Presumably, it satisfies the rabbis who penned the rules, but does it satisfy God? So here's a question. Does anyone know the bag limit on Easter bunnies? Please don't judge my people for following interpretations or traditions that seem odd. I mean, what could be a bigger stretch than the Easter bunny or Christmas trees? If we're honest and objective, Christians have as many strange traditions as Jews. They're just not strange to the same folks. No one has a monopoly on hypocrisy. I will also say that Judaism has some of the most beautiful and meaningful traditions imaginable. There's a great need for tradition in the human experience. Traditions enrich our lives. However, I also believe there's an even greater need for truth in the human soul. So here's another question. Why is matzah striped and pierced? Well, consider a simple Messianic Jewish twist that could become a curious myth or challenging tradition if left unquestioned. Why is matzah striped and pierced? For some of us, it's become our matzah flag. I might even suggest we could call it the scars and stripes. The imagery is great, and it perfectly fits our narrative about Jesus. And as we say in Texas, that preaches... But another Texas truism is also relevant. That dog won't hunt. Why is our matzah striped and pierced? The answer is really quite simple. That's the way Manischewitz makes the matzah. In the Middle Ages, the answer would have been very different. Community ovens were used to bake the holiday needs. The perforations were accomplished with the aid of a special tool resembling a little wheel with sharp teeth, correctly known as a riddle. These were used to be certain that no moisture bubbles were trapped in the dough that would lead to fermentation. 
No pun intended, but please don't think I like bursting bubbles. I don't. Nevertheless, accuracy and honesty are much-needed characteristics in modern Christian scholarship. Some who believe that Jesus is the Messiah try to find a Christological emphasis for every aspect of the Passover tradition, and sometimes we go too far. There's no need to insist that the pierced matzah reflects the symbolism of the nails and spear wound endured by Jesus. It is too easily suggested that the grooves and dark stripes on the matzah are there to represent the lash marks that scarred the back of Jesus. That provides a handy story to tell, but it is merely a pleasant result of modern mass production in matzah bakeries. In harmony with all Orthodox Christians, I absolutely believe that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I just don't need Manischewitz to believe the report of the Gospels. I need the Bible. Now, personally, I choose to believe that the entire Bible is inspired, inerrant, and indispensable in our quest to know God. Like the old country preacher said, I believe the whole Bible from the table of contents to the maps. I believe the Bible because God's grace has enabled me to believe the truth. More relevant, the lack of a Christological implication in the manufacturing process of matzah in no way negates the value of the biblical command to eat unleavened bread in remembrance of the Exodus. And Jesus understood the obligation. The apostles believed it was important, and it is to our own detriment to disregard the celebration. Sadly, modern matzah does not look like ancient matzah. One can only hope it tasted better in the old days, but I doubt it. Here's another question. Is Christ in the Passover? Well, of course, Christ is in the Passover. But for my purposes, I would rather remind my readers that Christ was at the Passover. Were you? Do the physical attributes of modern matzah allow us to present a coincidental similarity to our picture of the suffering of Jesus? Do spiritual applications exist? Absolutely. The middle matzah is symbolic of the lamb. The lamb is symbolic of Jesus. So the matzah metaphor is perfect, and the modern picture-perfect machine-pierced matzah is striped and pierced before it is shrink-wrapped in the box. But let's remember that many traditions are imposed. They are not implicit or demanded. And these facts are incontrovertible. Consider the following. Matzah is the lechem oni, the bread of affliction. Certainly Jesus suffered and endured affliction. All believers can recognize messianic significance in the redemption from bondage and slavery. It brings joy and confidence to identify that Jesus became our Paschal Lamb. The children of Israel were spared and redeemed from the destruction brought by the angel of death, and redemption came through the application of the blood of the Paschal Lamb onto the doorposts of their homes. The blood of Christ redeems us from the destructive judgment that would otherwise be our destiny. Instead, the blood of the Lamb covers our sins. And there's a sense in which his blood has been applied to the doorposts of our hearts. Jesus secured our deliverance. God, on the other hand, is more than a lamb. God provided the lamb. Never forget he also sent a flood to Noah and plagues to Egypt. Ignore his demand for justice and judgment at your own peril. Who? killed the Egyptian baby boys. Who was the destroyer that killed the firstborn sons of the Egyptians? Well, I have an answer. Many presume the killer was the angel of death. Uh, wrong. Not exactly. Both in Scripture and in the Haggadah, the perpetrator is more correctly known as the Lord. My parents' version of the Haggadah 
Yes, that one created by the wonderful wellspring of theological wisdom, Maxwell House Coffee. Our family Haggadah from my youth reads as follows. I will pass through the land of Egypt, I myself, and not an angel. And the text continues, and I will smite every firstborn, I myself, and not a seraph. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I myself, and not a messenger. I, the eternal, I am he, and none other. This might sound unreasonable to those who believe that God is a cosmic teddy bear promising warm, fuzzy feelings for all who choose to live in his gentle kingdom, but that world is unrealistic. Some modern monotheists are unwilling to answer fundamental questions that might shake their faith in a teddy bear God. There is no God of warm fuzzies who is only responsible for sunshine, health, wealth, and peace. If there was, what of storms, death, poverty, and destruction. In contradistinction, the God of Israel is Lord of the sunshine, Lord of the rain, and most assuredly Lord of the rainbow. He's more than a teddy bear God. He's also Job's God who permitted loss and unwarranted suffering. How can a teddy bear God of naive believers shoulder the burden of responsibility for destroying every living person on the face of the earth except those in Noah's family. God is Lord of all and Lord over circumstance. Within a modern humanistic framework for God, such devastation might appear irreconcilable. I propose that Jews and Christians who respect the scriptures should nurture a corrected view. We should study to transcend the simplistic view of the teddy bear God. We must seek to understand God from the vantage point of biblical Israel. The children of Israel saw the God of might and power. God redeemed Israel with his mighty outstretched arm, and in so doing, he also commanded them to keep the Passover in remembrance of the occasion. My dog-eared King James Bible declares, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I hope you're enjoying this series so far. If you want to keep up with it, I highly recommend that you follow us on social media so you don't miss out on anything. You can find us on all the major platforms with the handle at Crosstalk TV. You can also check us out online at crosstalk.org and give us a call if you want. 1-800-688-3422. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, shalom and God bless.